Morning, everyone, or afternoon, sorry. Um, my name is Amalsha. I'm the acting program manager at the African Doctoral Academy. And today we'll be having our webinar on burning bright and burning out. So looking at burnout in the time of COVID and beyond. Um, just to let everyone know, I am recording this session. So um, it will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel and our website um, afterwards. Um, so I would like to welcome Dr. Kerry, Kerry Ann Lowe from Stellenbosch University. She is a lecturer um, at the university um, and a psychiatrist. I will give Dr. Lowe a chance to introduce herself and um, then she can start with the presentation. At the end of her presentation, we will have a short Q&A session. So if you would like to ask any questions, um, please do put it in the chat and at the end of the session, I will um, ask the questions um, to Dr. Lowe. Um, yeah, without any further ado, Dr. Lowe, if you could um, please introduce yourself. Thank you so much. I think you are muted. <laughs> Sorry, it drives me crazy when people do that. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Amalsha, for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to be screen sharing my slides now, and I hope. Sorry. Here we go. I just uh, can I just triple check those are visible. You can see. Uh, I can see it. Yes. Thank okay, great. Thank you. I'll uh, turn my camera off just for bandwidth, but uh, hopefully everything is clear. So good afternoon again, and, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, our topic is burning bright and burning out self-care in the time of COVID-19 and beyond. And hopefully we will have some time for discussion and questions. So there's a little bit of debate still around burnout and whether burnout is distinct from depression. I think it's helpful to think about burnout as falling along a spectrum between normal stress and normal stress experience and that of clinical depression. The most commonly used definition is probably the Maslach definition, which you may be familiar with, that is defining burnout as a work-related syndrome with clinical features of overwhelming exhaustion, depersonalization, and diminished feelings of personal accomplishment. If we unpack those domains in a little bit more detail, the first is of emotional exhaustion. This is that feeling of just having nothing left to give. It can include somatic or bodily symptoms such as fatigue or sleep disturbance, and then psychological symptoms including irritability, poor concentration, anxiety, and depression. It's also that experience of not having enough emotional resources, feeling overextended and depleted. But really, as I said, that sense that you have nothing left to give others, nothing left to give your work. The second domain is depersonalization. This is an experience of being detached, being cynical, having impersonal feelings, treating other people as objects, and struggling to express empathy or grief. And then thirdly, diminished feelings of accomplishment. So this is an experience of incompetence, inefficiency, inadequacy, lack of productivity, or lack of value. So burnout has actually been included in the ICD-11 uh, diagnostic classification system as an occupational phenomenon. And I'll just read through this briefly. Burnout is a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It is characterized by three dimensions, and you'll see the overlap here. So feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job, or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job, and reduced professional efficacy. Importantly, burnout relates to specifically an occupational context, and it should not be applied to experiences in other areas of life. So very specifically, a workplace-based phenomenon. This is perhaps a more a romantic definition. So seeing burnout as a grief syndrome due to loss of our dreams or sense of purpose, of mission, leading to an experience of emotional depletion where expectations clash with an imposing reality. 
And I remember when I started my registrar training, I was going to be at Falkenberg Hospital and I imagined this wonderful place of learning where we would all sit under trees and think about mental illness. And of course, the reality was something very different. And it's that sense of when your expectations clash with the reality. And this is probably my favorite definition of burnout because I think it really just says what it is. The reduction of fuel or substance to nothing through use or combustion. I just want to step back a little bit. As I said, burnout is considered to be distinct from depression. And if we think a little bit about mood, before we talk more about clinical depression, mood is really a central human experience. When we talk about mood, we're describing the way we feel about ourselves, the world and our future. Of course, as human beings, we experience a wide range of moods. And low mood is normal at times, if you think about grief or loss as well as elevated mood. Think about getting engaged or, or uh, graduating or, you know, ex ex uh, very intense, beautiful life events. You'll feel quite elated, but probably only for a short time. So mood is considered to be disordered when it is persisting, incapacitating, impacting on relationships and impacting on function. If we look at the criteria for a major depressive disorder, sorry, um, this is now a clinical diagnosable syndrome. Uh, this is from the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that we use in psychiatry. So you need five or more symptoms that have been present for the same two-week period that also represent a change from previous functioning. At least one of the symptoms is depressed mood or loss of interest and pleasure. And you'll see now on the next slide, the other symptoms we look for are changes in appetite or weight, so weight loss or weight gain or increase or decrease in appetite, changes in sleep, so insomnia or hypersomnia, so sleeping too little or sleeping too much, psychomotor agitation or retardation, so physically feeling restless like you need to move or having a sense of kind of leaden weight or paralysis, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or excessive guilt, Difficulty concentrating or reduced ability to think or indecisiveness, so you're standing in the shops and you just can't choose what yoga to buy, that kind of feeling. And then recurrent thoughts of death, suicidal ideation, suicidal plans or suicide attempt. So again, depression is a clinical syndrome. You need five of these symptoms. One of them must be depressed mood or loss of interest and pleasure. And then other symptoms for a total of five, at least five, and they must be present most of the time for two weeks. So how do we measure burnout? There are many different scales that have been proposed. Again, you may be familiar with the Maslach Burnout Inventory. There are specific scales for specific settings. We haven't identified any biomarkers yet, but several systems have been studied, and these are, make sense biologically. So things like our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, our autonomic nervous system, our immune and metabolic processes, antioxidants, defense, hormones, and our sleep systems. If we re reflect a little bit on the higher education context, we know that there have been significant changes in the last two decades, and people experience a big imbalance between work demands and resources, with mounting workloads and unequal distribution of resources and subsidies. There's also been a decline in state subsidies in parallel with increasing and persistent demands to publish, acquire external funding, and high expectations around academic achievement. Many people in higher education perceive a lack of autonomy, and overall academic careers have become less attractive. And we know that burnout in university teachers is comparable to other areas, such as school teachers and healthcare professionals. So what are some of the drivers of burnout? If we look at the work environment, and you can tick the boxes as you think about these, but these are the things that drive the development and persistence of burnout. So inefficient work processes and environments, low organizational commitment, problems with organizational culture, monotonous tasks and high clerical burden, excessive workloads, imbalance between our job demands and our skills and resources, a lack of control, a sense of not having autonomy and a lack of meaning in the workplace, loss of support, conflict with superiors and colleagues, and work-home conflicts. 
And then on top of that background that we've just reflected on, along came the COVID-19 pandemic. We know, and you don't need me to tell you this, but how deeply people have suffered at an individual level. Uh, and people may have experienced illness themselves, they may have experienced loss of loved ones to the, loved ones to the illness, anxiety around the illness, anxiety related to the various waves and the impact that social and physical distancing measures have had. And there have been incredible indirect impacts, so loss of work, loss of work of spouse and family, having to homeschool children and not being able to access our normal coping strategies like exercise or social connectiveness with colleagues or peers or family. And there's been this incredible adaptation to a virtual world, which on one hand has been very exciting, but for many of us, there's been a steep learning curve and adaptation to virtual social connection, but also to workplace interactions. Um, for many people, they may spend a lot of their time in virtual meetings, and we've lost a lot of the buffers. You used to walk, at least walk from A to B when you had a meeting. Now it's entirely possible to click and just go from one meeting to the next without any space. We've also become really distracted. So I'm sure some of you during this uh, webinar are also maybe emailing or on your phone or WhatsApping. You know, we've just become very distracted, very virtual intense, and, and that's led to strains and stresses on our mental well-being. So there are different phases that we've gone through with the pandemic. There's been the anxiety phase, and this happens even between waves. You know, worry and concerns about what to expect, what's going to happen, what is the next lockdown going to look at. There's the intense phase where we reach a peak of a wave, where there are high illness experiences amongst our social as well as work colleagues. Um, you may yourself have experienced illness and that's impacted on your ability to work and function. And then there's a resolution phase where things tend to calm down, but that's often where we are left reflecting on the traumas that have been experienced during the peak of the wave, and that's trauma and loss. And then there is, of course, the vaccine phase, which, which can be very stressful for many because of different beliefs. You may find yourself battling and arguing with, with family members or colleagues on social media around vaccinations, so it's also brought its own stresses. And there's where we, I think we are now, which is very much the phase of this is over, I want to forget about it and move on with life, but I don't think that's been very easy for all of us. So when we think about stress, stress is perceived threat to our homeostasis. So some stress is good, we all need some stress to motivate and drive us, and many of you might find that you actually function optimally when you feel a little bit of stress and you've got deadlines to work towards. But too much stress is bad and can certainly lead and trigger burnout or even clinical depression. So how much is too much? This depends on our appraisal of the experience, the potential consequences of the experience, and the choice of different coping strategies that we may use to manage our stress. There are many different proposed stress models. I just want to reference two. The one is the cumulative stress model. So the idea that stress just builds and builds and builds until you get to a point that you can't cope. And I think this is a relative, sorry, relevant model in the time of COVID, where people were probably already super stressed before, and then along came additional strains and stresses, adaptations, trauma and loss, which for many people pushed over into experiencing psychological symptoms like depression, anxiety, insomnia, difficulty with concentration and thinking. Another model is the match-mismatch model, and this is a model which really just speaks to you have a certain amount of resources and then you have a certain amount of stress. If there's a mismatch, you end up struggling with burnout and psychological distress. And again, I think important in the time of COVID where we were unprepared and had to go through significant adaptations to the social and physical distancing measures. And for those working in healthcare, of course, the incredible burden of the pandemic on the health system and the huge impact on one's everyday work life. So we know that burnout has significant negative consequences, and I want to reflect on some of those now. Personal consequences include things like lower work satisfaction, disruption of personal relationships, poor physical health, so it could mean the aggravation of chronic physical health conditions like diabetes or high blood pressure, or new onset of physical health conditions. Burnout can lead to, lead to problematic substance use, 
and psychiatric consequences, including depression and suicide. People with burnout may have regret around their job choices and are actually at increased risk of motor vehicle accidents. Burnout also has negative organizational consequences. These include reduced productivity, higher job turnover, early retirement, absenteeism, presenteeism. So presenteeism is when you're there, but you're not really there. I think we're often presentees at work. We're just not functioning at our full and best capacity. Low levels of workplace commitment, low workplace productivity, increased organizational costs, and the negative impact on colleagues. So we see higher rates of inter-colleague conflict and disruption of relationships and work structures. And then there can be ethical consequences to burnout as well. So it may lead to boundary violations in the workplace, professional misconduct, and violating ethical conduct rules. So I just want to take a moment and just think a little bit, is this happening to me? And this is important because Burnout often has a slow and subtle onset, and it's the kind of thing where you, you're okay until you realize, actually, I'm, I'm really not okay, but we often don't see it happening until one of our warning signs appears. So think about the following. Have you noticed any change to your mood, your energy levels, your quality of your sleep, change in your appetite, eating too much or too little, and your ability co to concentrate, think, and make decisions? Have you noticed irritability and anger? Maybe you're very quick to lose your temper with colleagues. Are you experiencing chronic lateness, absenteeism or presenteeism? Have you found yourself making more mistakes than usual? Are you losing contact or connection with your family, your social support and your colleagues? And remember, one can be present physically at a dinner table or at home, but not really be there and connected emotionally to the people around you. Have you started using drugs or alcohol to cope? And you know, there's a difference between having a, you know, a glass of wine at the end of the day and then having a glass of wine when you're feeling like you, you just can't cope and you deserve it to help you manage your stress levels. Perhaps you're using over-the-counter medications to help you manage symptoms. And if you are a, a prescriber, a medical prescriber, are you prescribing your own medication for, for misuse purposes? And of course, at its most concerning and extreme, have you had thoughts about death or dying or suicidal thoughts, fantasies or plans? So when is the time to get help if you're experiencing burnout? If you have signs of burnout or depression, one really must seek help. And I think sometimes people experience things very uh, in a very black or white sense. So I'm either OK or I need to be certified and admitted to a psychiatric hospital. That is really not the case. There's a whole spectrum of human experience and we need to challenge the self and external stigma around mental health and accessing mental health and support. So really, if you have signs or symptoms, it's time to get help, but it doesn't necessarily mean an extreme thing that you're fearing. It might be something really simple and we're gonna talk through some of the, the self-help strategies that one can use. If someone in your family or a colleague is worried that you might be depressed or struggling with substance use or burnout, it's time to seek help. Now, often this is difficult because if someone comes to us and says, oh, I'm worried, you're a bit low, or I think you might be burnt out, we often get quite defensive and, and we might feel embarrassed, shame or stigma. We might become defensive and say, well, if you think I'm burnt out, you should see what you're doing. And really, I would encourage everybody, if somebody does come to you and express concern, that really to, first of all, understand and respect that it takes a very brave person to tell someone that they're worried about them. And you should really just listen to that person coming to you. Often when we are unwell mentally or burnt out, we lose that insight into how we're really doing. So it's actually valuable if someone we trust can come to us and say, look, I'm worried about you, you're not yourself, not to get angry and defensive, but rather to be open to accessing help. Of course, if you have suicidal thoughts, plans or fantasies, this is a time to urgently seek help. If you have any untreated mental or physical illnesses, it's time to seek help. And often when we're stressed, we tend to neglect our physical and mental health um, problems and we don't access the care that we need. And I really like to highlight that we shouldn't self-treat or self-manage, particularly if you are a health practitioner or a psychologist psychiatrist, medical doctor, you know, just to be cautious that we don't self-manage and self-treat. This is really one of the times that you need to outsource, you need to get somebody involved to help you develop a, man develop a management plan. 
So finding help is not always that easy. I recommend usually for burnout and mild depression that you can think about lifestyle interventions or psychotherapy or counseling. More moderate to severe depression, I recommend seeing a GP with experience in mental health or accessing a psychiatrist. Moderate to severe depression with a medical and psychiatric, co psychiatric comorbidity, probably worth consulting with a psychiatrist. And of course, if you have suicidal thinking, you need an urgent assessment. Now, I know it is actually incredibly difficult to find mental health professionals. People have long waiting lists, and I often have friends and family reaching out just because they're struggling to access people. So I know it can be challenging. I am going to share some resources, but I just want to highlight if, if you have urgent symptoms like suicidal thoughts and fantasies, it really is important to access help urgently. If you can't get an appointment with a psychiatrist, then please access a GP. At least get an assessment and management plan. Don't wait. Um, but I do want to just acknowledge that it is incredibly difficult to access mental health professionals. A lot of people, are, they just don't know where to start. How do I find someone? A lot of people have had bad experiences in the past and then they don't, they don't want to access again. And I, I just always remind people that, you know, you get good lawyers and bad lawyers and good bus drivers and bad bus drivers and, and you may end up seeing a, a mental health professional that you're not happy with. Sometimes this is just a fitness thing, but really to persevere and try access the right kind of person for you. So as I said, I just wanted to share some, some ways to access resources. This is a screenshot from the South African Depression and Anxiety Group website. It's www.sadag.org. This is a very helpful resource site. I always highlight the Suicide Helpline. That's the top one there, 0800 567 567. Worth knowing for yourself and colleagues and others you may come across in your career. But they have a range of other helplines listed there on the right. So many different help, mental health helplines, substance use helplines that you can access. They also have other resources on their website. So information pamphlets on, on mental disorders, and they also have other virtual spaces that are helpful, Facebook Fridays where experts are available to answer questions. So a nice resource to be aware of. And this is from the South African, of, South African Society of Psychiatrists webpage. That's uh, my professional body's organization. They have a find a psychiatrist function, so you can just enter your area and you can search and find a psychiatrist near you. And this, this is the Mental Health Information Center. It's another great resource. They have a, a website with information, but also a contact us function. Janine Ruiz is the person involved there. She's really lovely. You can reach out and make contact about resources in your area and all kinds of mental health resources, psychiatry, psychology, occupational therapy, and others. So those are some resources. And now we're going to move on to thinking about managing burnout. Really, one has to reduce risk by looking at both structural or organizational factors and then individual support as well. And I think this is important to reflect on because if you are working in a difficult or toxic environment, it can make you feel quite frustrated if someone wants to talk to you about building up your resilience so you can go out into an abnormal situation. And I think COVID really highlighted that this, this wasn't an abnormal response. I mean, this was a very abnormal situation where people were experiencing loss and trauma and pain and suffering. And it's not always about putting the face mask on the canary and sending the canary into the coal mine. Sometimes you need to fix the coal mine. So some of the structural and organizational interventions for burnout include modifying work processes, supporting flexible work schedules, importantly, creating a non-punitive culture that promotes help seeking, increasing control and participation of employees in decision-making processes, having clearly defined roles and organizational structure, improving the physical environment of the workplace, having good, clear communication structures, team building exercises, and then training for leadership and management structures. There are also a range of individual interventions that have been studied. These include things like stress management, self-care training, communication skills training, relaxation skills training, coping skills, mindfulness-based approaches, which I'll talk a little bit more about just now, cognitive behavior therapy-based approaches, health promotion, including things like sleep and exercise, and then engaging in small group activities around shared group, sorry, shared work experience. 
So some authors reflect on managing burnout in, in different circumstances. So defining circumstantial burnout, where there's a reaction to environmental challenges. The focus then should be on resolving workplace challenges, nurturing personal life and, where necessary, taking time off. As opposed to existential burnout, which is more of an internalized struggle, and the recommended management is then on recognizing and validating the experience, forming connections, finding meaning, and forming a professional identity with clear roles. But I want to focus now, and as I said, my, my important highlight point is that you need to look at organizational elements when you tackle burnout within any environment. But we're going to focus now on looking at things that people can do individually. But I just want to say I completely recognize that for many people, there are structural issues potentially beyond your control that can be, be very frustrating and can contribute to your experience. But now we're going to look at individual strategies and some hopefully helpful techniques that you can use to prevent and manage burnout. So if you go into any bookshop, you're going to see a range of books like this. I always think if you want to make a lot of money, put a swear word into a self-help book and you'll do well. And it really just highlights how much is a need out there and how popular this is right now when we look at self-help and, and individual strategies. But let's look now at some, some practical and evidence-based individual interventions that you might find helpful in the prevention and management of burnout. So the first one is exercise. So exercise is absolutely critical and so important for our physical and mental health. The World Health Organization recommends at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity throughout the week. Now that's quite a lot. That's two and a half hours, which can be difficult to fit in between busy work or student life and managing family and other personal demands and, and um, needs. Often this is one of the first things to go when we're feeling stressed and burnout. I know for our registrars, whenever exams are approaching, one of the first things they do is stop exercising and then they end up feeling depressed and struggling to cope because they're not engaging in this very necessary and important mental and physical health treatment, if we're going to call it that. But exercise is really important. What you do is, is less important than the fact that you're doing something. And I really encourage that people find exercise that they enjoy, something that they can do with, with a buddy, that they can do with someone who motivates them, and just things that are fun. There's no point setting up an unrealistic exercise program that you're just going to find frustrating. It's about finding fun things that are practical within your life and your work-life constraints. But exercise is really, really important to build into your every week. And I often encourage my patients to plan to exercise every day because you're going to miss out on some days and then you hit a target of exercising at least five days a week if you can. The next strategy I call going green, and this is around connecting with nature. And the research in this area is actually, it's fascinating and, and quite beautiful to look at. Being in nature is actually like a multivitamin. We know that seeing natural scenes is helpful. They've done studies where you have patients in a surgical ward. One of the patients has a picture of a forest, the other doesn't. The one with the picture of the forest recovers better. So visually seeing nature has been shown to be beneficial, as is hearing natural sounds, smelling nature. But if you go out and you're physically in nature, that's why I call it a multivitamin, you get all these aspects, the sight, the sound, the smell, the taste even. It's been shown that going for a two hour walk in a forest has actually boosts, boosted our natural immunity up until two weeks later. So being in natural spaces helps our, our body, it helps our immune system, and it also helps our mental well-being. It's also been shown that experiences of awe, so things like seeing a beautiful sunset or seeing an animal in nature, that wow experience improves our mental well-being and our mental health. And we're very privileged in South Africa. We have a lot of beautiful green spaces. I also encourage when it's possible that you combine time in nature with exercise. So if you can walk in a natural space, of course, in a safe way, this is something that's really good. And one can even bring nature to you. So having blue, so that's water and green plant spaces in your work environment. So basically having a pot plant, um, you know, is in itself helpful in terms of the benefits of nature. And then mindfulness. Now, mindfulness has become very, very popular. You may have seen posters for things like mindfulness wine festivals. So it's really become uh, quite a marketing technique. 
But at its core, the concept of mindfulness is about being present in the moment in a non-judgmental way. It's based in very ancient Eastern philosophies that have been adapted and adopted into Western medical culture. And this image is really just describing it. You'll see the person walking with the dog, how the person is distracted, thinking about yesterday and what needs to be done tomorrow and the to-do list. And the dog is just there enjoying the walk. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this experience. Again, I spoke about this in the virtual context of us being constantly distracted, always on our phones, getting beeps and notifications. We're constantly um, pulled into other things places and spaces and we're very really just present in the moment experiencing it and the concept of non-judgment is is that it's okay to be present even with a difficult experience or emotion that one can just be there without necessarily judging or trying to change it so there are many different resources now mindfulness is not for everybody but if it's something that you're interested in or something that you found helpful there are many different resources you can look at I can recommend the two books there. So Full Catastrophe Living by John Kabat-Zinn. This is looking at coping with stress, pain and illness using mindfulness meditation. It's a very popular book and goes through some of the key principles. And then The Mindful Way Through Depression by Mark Williams and his team. And this really looks at using mindful techniques to manage and prevent depression. So those are two books you can have a look at. And then there are a range of websites. In the little pink table, you'll see a range of mindfulness resource links. Some of these were COVID specific, but there are many free apps and websites where you can learn a little bit more about mindfulness and have access to tools. So things like mindfulness meditations or body scans, that you can listen to and, and get a sense if this is something I would like to build into my life. Now, mindfulness, like exercise, is not just something you do once off and then that's forever. It's really a, a tool that you build in. It may be as simple as doing a, an exercise while you're washing the dishes or at night or being focused on your breathing while you're sitting at a robot, but it is something that needs to be built in every day in order to have good effect. And then connection, and again, this has become so critical in the time of COVID, and I think we've all learned and seen this, how we need to be connected to people and as far as possible in face-to-face -face ways. Although we're lucky that we can use virtual spaces to connect when it's not safe to, we really need to work on our connection, particularly when we are burnt out and stressed and depressed. Often what we do when we're feeling a lot of stress is we cut things out, like I gave the example of exercise, but something else we tend to cut out is time with people, that connection. So, you know, I, I won't go to that party tonight or I, I don't have time to call that friend. I need to get through this work goal. We take those things out and our life becomes really small. So the circle is basically work, stress, sleep, work, stress, sleep. And the concept of connection is about making that circle bigger again bringing things back into our lives, that connection, whether it's spiritual, our social, our communities, our families. And again, that concept of being present. So I know I can, my husband can call me when I'm at work, I can speak to him, I can answer his questions, but I'm not really listening, I'm not really there. And I'm sure many of you have had that experience, you come home to a family member or a partner or a spouse at the end of the day, and you're still at work, you're, or you're thinking about a, a goal or a task, and you're not really connecting, you're not looking them in the eye, you're not feeling that sense of, of human connection. So again, I really encourage that we think about how to strengthen connection in our work and social spaces. And I just want to share a quote from Option B. This is a book by Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant, uh, just again reflecting on the concept of connection. So this is from a section, Finding Hope and Building Resilient Communities. Believing in new possibilities helps people fight back against the idea of permanence and propels them to seek new options. They find the will and the way to move forward. Resilient communities have strong social ties, bonds between people, bridges between groups and links to local leaders. Empowering communities builds collective resilience. We found our humanity, our will to live and our ability to love in our own connections to one another. Just as individuals can find post-traumatic growth and become stronger, so can communities. You never know when your community will need to call on that strength, but you can be sure that someday it will. And I th you know, this was actually written pre-COVID, and I think it's even more important now when at both an individual, organizational and community level, so much has been lost. And this is really the time to build connection 
in order to build resilience within our communities. And that leads on to the concept of mentoring and peer support. And this is really important in our environments. And I encourage people, certainly in the medical field, to find mentors outside of medicine because doctors and healthcare workers in particular tend to think the same way and tend to normalize the same problematic ways of thinking about and addressing stress and workplace problems. And I think for all of us, having different mentors for different kinds of challenges and mentors from different environments, different ages, cultures, backgrounds is so critical and so important. And as is peer support, and again, a lot of this was lost in COVID, and I think we really took for granted things like the coffee room or just being in an academic space together. We transitioned to a full virtual academic program for our registrars in the initial uh, waves of the pandemic, and it was really two full years nearly that we had virtual only teaching. And what we saw is that within the registrar group, there actually wasn't great connection because people had started on the program, they'd never even met people, and they didn't have that time between lectures just to connect or grab a cup of coffee or, you know, share a story over lunch. You know, we, we took that away as was necessary at the time, but in retrospect, we realized how important this was that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, that peer-to-peer -peer support that we rely on very heavy, heavily when we're working in difficult environments. And then exploring and connecting with creative ways that bring reflective, restorative and regenerative practices to our life. Now, this is not something that one can prescribe. It's obviously very individualized, but I'm sure everyone can think about that thing you do that, that brings you alive and that makes you feel connected to yourself and the world around you. And these images just share some of the examples and we're all different in terms of those things that bring us joy and, and bring us life. And again, like exercise, like human contact, these are the things we tend to cut out when we're feeling stressed. You know, I won't go to ceramics tonight or I'm not gonna do my photography or my writing or my journaling or my painting because I just wanna meet that deadline that actually these are the things that, that bring us joy, that bring us vitality, and again, that help us feel connected to ourselves and our community. So again, to encourage you to bring these practices back into your life if you've neglected them or cut them out in order to cope with work stress and work demands. And then sleep. So insomnia or difficulty sleeping is, is a, definitely a, often a warning sign for many of us that we're feeling stressed and that we're not coping with, with our stress. And having good sleep is, is really important for physical and mental health. In fact, there have been cases where shift workers, so people who, who work overnight shifts, are claiming for workers' compensation when they've developed cancers because we've seen the negative impact of chronic sleep deprivation. For those who are interested, and if you find you someone who does struggle with your sleep when you're stressed, I can really recommend Melissa Milanak's YouTube videos. If you just go to YouTube and you search Mel Melissa Milanak's sleep, one of them will come up. This is just one example of them. She did a couple of talks around sleeping well through COVID. She's an expert in, in sleep uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia interventions. So she gives really nice practical talks, giving practical tips around improving sleep. So things like limiting time in bed, good sleep hygiene, hygiene techniques, worry journaling at bedtime. So please have a look. The most of them are around 30, 40 minutes, and they really are worth looking at if you're someone who finds that sleep disruption is one of your warning signs when you're stressed. And then unplugging, I, I think I've reflected quite a lot on this already as we've been talking, but we really are so connected all the time now. And Technology is wonderful. I mean, it's allowed for us to do some amazing things. And of course, we should use it where it serves us. But there are also some very unhealthy or unhelpful things about technology. What I've realized is my work day starts the minute I look at my phone. Because once I pick it up, you can see the notification without even opening the, the screen. And then I'm already thinking and worrying about that. And for many of us, checking our email, checking our WhatsApp is the first thing we do when we wake up and the last thing we do at, at night. And we may even have our phones right above our beds next to us with, with notifications waking us up in the night. And we know coming back to sleep that screen time, particularly you know, a TV, phone, computers, can also negatively impact on the quality and quantity of our sleep. And uh, you can just think for yourself, how many WhatsApp groups are you in? How many messages do you get 
every day? Are you constantly monitoring and responding? And of course, there's social media, which can be a rabbit hole and a, a drain on our time and our emotional resources. It can be quite addictive. It's a quick fix. It's a bit of a buzz going on to Instagram or Facebook. Um, but it often distracts us for what is what is important and what we really value in our lives. And the distraction is important. You know, if you're working and you get a beep or a buzz on your phone or from your email, it takes at least 15 minutes to get back to the same level of concentration. So if you're working on a presentation or you're writing something up and you're getting buzzed and beeped every few minutes, you can think about how that negatively impacts on your concentration. And we often have very few places and spaces in our life for real deep work where we can really sit down and be creative and generate you know, wonderful academic things because of the level of distraction we're all under. So think a little bit about how you can unplug. And there's some practical uh, tips you can use. So things like buffering between virtual meetings, you know, set a time, 10 minute break between meeting one and two that you don't just click in and out and, and have this going from one meeting to the other, you know, create that space where you'd normally be walking from the room to the venue. The other thing is putting your phone on airplane mode. You know, you still have it with you if you need to use the camera or call an Uber or, you know, research something. But if it's in airplane mode during that time that you're wanting a break, you actually don't have that constant notification interrupting you. So that's something you can do. And to actually schedule tech-free time in your day. Some people even take a tech Sabbath where they may take a day out on the weekend that they don't use a phone or a computer. That can be tricky depending on your circumstances. But think about having some time in your week where there's, there's no phone, there's no computer, no TV, that you can actually just disconnect and unplug from that constant virtual engagement. And think about the apps you have, think about your social media usage, think about how you engage with WhatsApp and email, is there a way that you can optimize your mental well-being, but also your functioning by managing those spaces in a, in a more productive way? And then taking leave and being on leave. So I'm sure if some of you are guilty of this. You, you save your leave in order to finish that deadline, uh, meet that project, catch up on, on that write-up. And it's really important that we actually use our leave. Many people resign with burnout with leave that is untaken. So plan your leave and make sure that when you are on leave, you are detached. Again, if you think about managing WhatsApp and email, putting an out of office on, silencing WhatsApp groups, um, switching off apps or notifications. Think about how you can do that because again, you can be on leave and you get a, a notification, you see an email, you see a message. You, you already start worrying about it. Even if you say, okay, I'll deal with this when I come back. Now your, your, your unconscious is already worrying and trying to find solutions to that problem. So think about how you can really detach. And then that brings me, we're kind of coming to the end now, of the concept of workplace engagement. So this is the opposite of burnout. And this is something I think maybe feels unfamiliar to many of us if we are feeling burnt out at the moment. But this is the idea of being connected to the work we do, feeling absorbed, passionate, energetic and enthusiastic in our work environments and being invested again. Um, you know, we are often called to our work and we're drawn to something and we feel passionate and excited about it. And then if you remember that definition where the reality clashes with your expectations, you can end up becoming cynical and detached and emotionally depleted and feeling unconfident and unvalued. So think about a time when you felt invested, what that felt like, what drew you to a work environment, that sense of being emotionally committed, and how do we reconnect with those parts of ourselves, our colleagues, the, the people we work with in our work environments, how do we reconnect with those people and places and spaces that make us come alive and feel alive in our work environments? And good workplace engagement is strengthened by good management and leadership, also by having meaningful work, and by our relationships with our colleagues. And again, this is why I think COVID has been so difficult for so many people because in overnight that connection was taken away. And I think we've all realized how strongly we rely on that connection with people in our work environments to feel human, to feel like we belong, to feel passionate about what we do. So thank you very much. That brings me to the end of, of what I'd like to share today. We do have some time for questions and comments. 
And again, just want to thank you for your time. And uh, please let me know if there's anything you want to unpack or explore a little bit more together now that we have question time. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Um, I see there are some questions. Um, just give me a second. I just want to allow the participants to unmute. There we go. So um, if you have a question, please um, unmute yourself and um, ask away. Okay, um, th thank you so much, uh, Doctor, for a very wonderful presentation. Um, I just wanted to, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? yes, I can hear you. Yes, I, I can hear you. Okay, great. So um, thank you so much for a very wonderful presentation. And um, I just wanted to add that you spoke something about nature. Um, there is also a website called, called noisely.com. Uh, noisely.com, um, if you click on it or if you access it, you can actually access a river flowing, thunder, whatever and it can really calm you down if you are very very tired or you are stressed thank you thanks for sharing and, and that's an example of just natural sounds are good for us and i find the, the literature on being in nature so fascinating because i suppose from an evolutionary perspective that's how we, we grew and, and these are the things our bodies and our minds need to be well but we've created these environments which are you know, and there's a lot around sort of noise, you know, not your nice noises you were talking about, but kind of noise pollution and buildings retaining heat and all of that and the stress. Um, and if you can really disconnect and be in nature or use sites like this or apps with natural sounds or images or plants in your environment, it can make a big difference. So th thanks for sharing that resource. There's a question here. Um, is there a burnout hangover that one should look out for after recovering? <laughs> The short answer is yes. I think that um, burnout can take a long time to manage. It depends on the, the severity. And as I said, you know, you, everyone's on a spectrum. You know, there can be a little bit of burnout. There can be a lot of burnout. There can be depression. But certainly it can take a long time to recover. And even after one has recovered, the, the physical and mental health symptoms do take time to fully resolve. So that I think one must be be kind to oneself and and give yourself time to recover if you've experienced significant burnout. So so definitely. Um, and I'm sure many of you have had when you've been through a lot of stress, like a big exam or a PhD. Or, you know, often people when that stress dissipates feel a bit flat. You know, because they you know that kind of post PhD blues or, or post exam blues. And it really is because our biology takes time to reset. When we are chronically stressed, it changes our brain, it changes our adrenal glands, it changes our body's biochemistry, and this takes time to recalibrate. So I think one can definitely have a, a physical and psychological burnout hangover and just to be kind and patient as you recover. Thank you, Dr. Lo. There is a hand up by Sibangi, Sibangani sorry, Dube. Um, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, maybe it was a previous question. The hand is down now. Um, okay, can I ask oh, a question? Uh, yes, no problem. Go ahead. Yeah, what do you do if you notice that there is that depression or signs, but it's a child? Maybe, you know, the teenagers now, they're going through so much and they don't want, as a parent, to ask and the person said, oh, no, I've got nothing to, to worry about. I don't have anything to tell you, but you can see something is wrong. How do you intervene without making the child or the person feel worse off than they were feeling before you started asking questions? Thank you. That, that's an interesting and important question. Um, I'm going to just start by, sorry, this is not quite your question, but I just want to say this. Often we are scared to ask people. We don't want to give them ideas that maybe they're worse than they are. But for many people struggling with mental health problems it's or depression or burnout, it can be very validating and normalizing if somebody can just ask and open up that conversation. 
Children and adolescents are obviously more challenging for, for all the different reasons. There are resources, again, um, you don't want to necessarily push, but it's about, as a parent, having an open door, acknowledging that you're seeing something, um, encouraging access to peer and other support spaces, maybe through school or a church or another community organization. Again, I can recommend the SADAG site. They have these Facebook Fridays where they have experts who talk about things, including teen suicide and teen mental health. So, you, and again, the, you know, it might be about accessing online resources and online support st spaces. Obviously, if you are very concerned, so, you know, a child is not sleeping, not eating, uh, there's school problems, school failure, they're withdrawing from their peers, they're withdrawing from the family, their hobbies, then you may need to take the child in, maybe to a GP, just to get an assessment or to access mental health support. And of course, if you are concerned about suicide, to access care urgently. But I think it's about being present, validating difficult experiences, having open doors, normalizing conversations about mental well-being and also modeling. So we need to model the kind of behavior we'd like to see in children and adolescents so that, that we share, that we are accessing support. Obviously, you don't unload on kids in an age and appropriate way. I'm not talking about that, but that, that families allow for conversations about emotions that allow for people to share feelings, you know, to um, avoid things like boys mustn't cry or don't cry, you know, let children express emotions, normalize healthy expression of emotion and model good behaviors around accessing your own mental health and support. And you consult, if you're not sure, you consult with somebody about what you're worried about and what should I do, you know, whether it's a, a helpline or a mental health professional. I hope that, that helps a bit. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Um, there's a hand from Rueda Malchas. Um, Rueda, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Yes, thanks. It just took a little while for my um, unmute button to work. Good afternoon, and uh, Katie, thank you very much. It was very insightful indeed. Um, I work with first generation students a lot in a small organization that I run on the side, um, and I notice that um, the kinds of uh, behavioral challenges that you're talking about um, and pressures that, that um, students are facing, I find especially prevalent in that group. But I'm wondering whether you are finding or you and your colleagues are finding similar trends in staff. Are people who are first generation graduates, staff members uh, experiencing higher levels? Um, well, not necessarily experience higher levels of stress and anxiety, but uh, are you finding that it's more prevalent? I find that we are often having to be pioneers on so many levels, uh, both in our homes and society and at work. Um, I'm just wondering whether you're noticing a trend like that at all or whether, you know, I'm just kind of missing something. But thank you. Rita, thanks. I mean, another very interesting question. I'm sorry, I don't have data to support. Um, there may be things out there. Um, I, I also do a lot of work with, with medical students and I do see similar challenges. Um, not so much with staff, although it's sort of difficult for me for staff because a lot of the people I work with, they are registrars and they're doctors. So I don't always think student staff necessarily, but, but certainly I, I do personally see that. There are obviously a whole lot of additional stresses and, and burdens that come with that role. So I, I think what you're experiencing is real um, and common. I just, sorry, I don't have the data to, su to support that, but there may well be nice qualitative research that's been done in that area. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Lowe. There is a question in the chat. How does it feel like to recover completely from burnout? Can one carry over the burnout symptoms when transitioning from one job to another and how to address the situation? It's a few questions there. Thanks. And I, I think sort of similar to the, the burnout hangover concept. Um, sort of difficult one to answer because if it, it, it does take time recovery would would be unique to you the person so we're all different we all have different energy levels we all have different connectedness um you know are are we introverts extroverts so I, I i can't i suppose describe what everybody's individual picture would look like because that'll be completely unique but i think it would be helpful to think when else did you feel like yourself and your best self your most alive self. Um, it may take time to get there. 
when there's been significant change and trauma in our lives, we don't necessarily always go back to a baseline. We might absorb something and go through post-traumatic growth and come out looking slightly different on the other side. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So um, when I say, when last did you feel like yourself, it doesn't mean you necessarily will go back to how you were prior to a difficult experience. You know, but do you do you feel like your sort of authentic best self? That sounds a little bit eerie fairy, but I hope you know what I mean, uh, the idea of, of being fully connected and engaged and alive in, in, in so far as, as you have experienced life and wellness and well-being. I also just want to say when you have residual symptoms like, let's just say, insomnia, these do need to be managed, particularly with depression. If somebody has been depressed and they have leftover symptoms, this predicts relapse. So if you have gone through an experience of depression and you've had treatment, but you still struggle with certain things, and it does take time, the cognitive symptoms of depression definitely take time to resolve. But if you are struggling, then go to your treatment provider and say, I'm still struggling with these things so that they can be managed. It might mean medication, it might mean augmentation with psychotherapy, um, but don't let residual symptoms lie untreated. So I'm saying different things there, but I think the one is be aware that things take time. Try think about yourself and that sense of, of being your true and best self. Are you there? And when you have residual symptoms and they're taking time, maybe connect with a provider, a counselor, psychologist, GP, psychiatrist, maybe a workplace wellness coordinator, if you have access to that, to just see these are the things I'm still struggling with, can they be managed? So it's being patient, giving time, but also not letting things linger that could make you vulnerable to relapse of burnout and depression. Does that answer, that was a chat question, I'm not sure if that answers it. Um, I hope it does, um, otherwise Dr. Ramaboli, you can come online and um, clarify. There is a hand by Sibangani Dubo. Would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? I, I, um, thank you, it is answered, so there we go. Um, are there any further questions? I don't see any hands up and nothing in the chat at the moment. Can I maybe, just sorry, the question sure. about changing jobs was an interesting one because um, we spoke about that toxic environment and maybe if you change to a better environment things will will resolve but there's also the idea that we take our stuff with us our suitcase so you might go to a different job and find you still struggling with certain things and it's worth thinking is this something from my side maybe i struggle with boundaries or maybe i've got bad time management or maybe there's some interpersonal stuff i need to work on so um you know, I, I believe very strongly that we must address environmental and organizational shift, but don't forget we, we bring ourselves into each environment and we might be carrying something with us that is, is aggravating or triggering these kind of symptoms. So just to reflect, reflect on that as well. Thanks, Dr. Lowe. Um, looks like we don't have any further questions. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm lying. <laughs> Here's one more. How does one deal with the stigma and challenge of managing this in the academic workplace? That's a good question. Workshops like this one today are offered, but systematically expectations of ac academics are so high and the to-do list is never done. Thank you. Um, I don't like questions like that because it's difficult. And often when I've spoken on burnout, people said like, the only way I can cope is by living this ridiculous, unboundaried, constant work life, and that's expected. And if I don't do this, I'm going to lose. You know, so I, I am very respectful and aware of the huge amount of pressures people are under. In terms of tackling and challenging stigma, it it, it is important. I mean, the the starting point is our own internal stigma. So to address that and our own help seeking behaviors, how we communicate about things like this. And then organizationally to look at the system. So transparency in terms of how to access help, challenging the stigma when it's there. Uh, there may be a punitive culture in your organization and workplace, and you may need to, again, challenge that. It is not easy to challenge these things. Some people just want to put their heads down, get through and move on, and that's okay. But I often say to people, there's no choice without loss. You can choose to do something and that might include risks or there may be consequences or more stigma. You can choose to not do anything, but don't think that that isn't without cost in terms of 
you know, yourself and the environment. And again, it's not saying what you should do. It's just to be aware that whether we act or don't act, there is a cost to, to both of those. And one just has to kind of reflect on that and, and weigh that up. Um, you know, I like to believe the change starts with us. It starts with conversations like this. It starts with showing up to a webinar or giving a webinar like this, having the conversations in your environments. These things do take time to change. But, you know, COVID in a way has been good because it's highlighted mental health and it's made it okay to speak about mental health. So because everybody lived through the pandemic, nobody was spared. You may not have had COVID, you may not have lost someone to COVID, but everybody lived through a pandemic. Everybody has had experiences of stress and distress and anxiety and fear and difficulty concentrating. So everybody's had these mental health experiences now. So people right now seem to be a lot more open to these ideas and challenge and being open to challenging sort of stigma and ways of thinking. So I, I think we are in, an, in a good time right now. Um, and it has to be embedded right in school programs, residency teaching, university programs, peer to peer interventions, because that's better. We had a question earlier about adolescents. You know, if your friend or if you're a varsity student, your colleague says to you, hey, I tried this and it worked, or why don't you go to that session? You'll do it. Whereas if, if the teacher or the, you know, kind of lecturer says that they won't. So peer to peer interventions are important. But again, I think, you know, we have to be the change we want to see in the world by, by um, you know, embracing these concepts, by talking about them, by thinking about it. And, you know, being kind when somebody has a problem or they're taking leave for mental health, not to be like, oh, you know, what's going on, but to be respectful, to think about how you communicate about mental health within your teams and within yourself. You know, are you do you treat yourself badly when you're struggling emotionally? And I like to give this example, you know, I'm sure if I tied your feet together, you could probably all do your jobs. Um, or even maybe if I tied one hand behind your back, you would manage. But why would I do that? Why would I make you less of who you are and expect you to do a great job. But we're so quick to do that with our mental health. You know, we, we disadvantage ourselves mentally, but we expect people to keep going and going. And for me, this uh, a paradigm shift to saying, let people be their best mentally well selves is good for everybody. Let's invest in that. And they teach lifeguards, you know, when you've got a, a body in the ocean and you're being washed against a rock, you're supposed to turn the the body towards the rock because if you turn towards the rock and you hit the rocks you you drown and then you both drown so it's not selfish to look after yourself first another example is put the oxygen mask on yourself before the child you know look after yourself first that you can be the best you can be in your environment whether you're a leader or a team member being your best self serves everybody and the environment around you so sorry, it's me going off on a bit of a tangent, but I hope I've responded to some of, of the challenges you're highlighting. You definitely did. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Um, there are some a few comments in the, the chat um, reflecting on this um, the situation with academia and how mental health is handled. Um, I just want to see if there's any specific questions. Um, this is also a very tough one. <laughs> Um, so I don't even know. Um, respond. Uh, Rud has made another comment about the the yes. first generation graduate, and I, I think it's it's so important because just just getting somebody into an environment is not an, enough. You know, you you have to support their unique needs so that they can successfully navigate that environment. Otherwise, you're setting that person up for failure. So I think it's very nice that you're reflecting on that in your own in, environment and. Really, I think it is important with everybody's story that brought them to the space. You've got to think about equipping them to navigate the space because it's not an intuitive space at all. Thank you. Sorry, I, I know there's a hard question coming up. Um, it's it says what concerns me is that the responsibility is placed on the individual to make the change. And yes, that is essential. Uh, that is an essential place to start. But how does one get more institutional or systemic buy-in and understanding? Yeah, that's a difficult one. Yeah, I mean, it, it is difficult and I, I, I'm not sure, I suppose in the audience, people have so many different spaces that, that, that would have different needs. But I think one can, um, and again, I'd, as I said, I'm so aware of putting the responsibility on the individual because sometimes I feel like that's all I can do in a lecture like this because I have no control over your environment. So again, I'm, I'm very much acknowledging that. And it's certainly um, 
you know, I know for my work with doctors, they, there's a lovely piece where the person says, you know, if you start by saying there's going to be resilience training and mindfulness and yoga, everybody wants to vomit because it's just so terrible. Um, you know, when actually the environment is so difficult and so awful to navigate. So I really am aware of that. But I think one can demand these things in a workplace um, through the right channels, through line management structures to say, you know, we want a policy, we want a transparent system to access well-being. Um, and to give feedback because often organizations, you know, there's a nice poster, there's a website, but on the ground you speak to people and they find it difficult to access, they long waiting times, there's stigma. So there also needs to be a, a space to give anonymous or confidential feedback about workplace systems that are not working. Um, but unfortunately, and unless you are yourself a leader, the only way in an environment is to Part of, I suppose, your your performance appraisal, your line management process to raise concerns when you feel these things are lacking in the environment, to create a sense of responsibility for the organisation. Because otherwise, organisations assume the wellness poster is up in the bathroom. We've done enough, and you need to say this is actually this is not enough. You're not addressing my workplace needs. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. Um, I don't see any further questions or hands. Um, so I think we can end it off here. Um, but yeah, thank you very, very much, Dr. Lowe, for such an informative session. I think everybody really enjoyed this very much because like someone mentioned in the chat, this is a good place to start where we have these kinds of questions, um, sessions where we can talk and engage about these things that generally, especially in the workplace, we don't really engage on. Um, so thank you so much for your time and presenting for the ADA. We've really appreciated it. And um, thank you also to all the delegates that have attended and um, taken the time out of their day to come and listen to this presentation and to engage with us in the chat and asking questions. So thank you so much again from the ADA. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye and good luck on your journeys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.